apologetics, and current events. From the housetops, coming up next. Our Quest for Happiness, The Creation of the Angels During the six days of creation, God brought into being an amazing variety of creatures. Each level of creation appeared more astonishing than the one below it. The sixth day saw the creation of man, the masterpiece, and the completion of the material universe. The fashioning of the material world, however, did not exhaust the creative plans of God, the infinite artist. He also created the angels. Angels are pure spirits gifted with powerful intellects and wills. The name angel, which means messenger, describes their work, for they are messengers of God. We do not know exactly when the angels were created. The common opinion of theologians is that they were created at the time of the creation of the world. They were created, as were all other creatures, by a simple act of God's divine will. He commanded, and they came into existence from the void of nothingness. As the psalmist says, Praise him, all you his angels. Praise him, all you his hosts. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded, and they were created. Psalm 148 We know that non-living things, as well as plants, animals, and men exist, because we can see and touch them. Angels, however, are invisible. What proof have we for the existence of such pure spirits, which we cannot see or contact with any of our five senses? The existence of the angels cannot be known positively through reason, but reason can surmise the probable existence of such beings from the orderly sequence of created things. Visible creation can be represented by a huge triangle, a pyramid. At the base we find the lowest form of being, non-living things. Above this we have three planes of living beings, each plane higher than the other, plants, animals, and man. The scale of beings up to man exhibits a fine gradation of perfection from the lower creature to the highest. Man at the peak of the triangle of visible things possesses a material body united with a spiritual soul. To complete the ascending scale of created things, things that exist between man and God, there should be some beings who are pure spirit, that is, beings without bodies, but possessing an intellect and a will. Angels would be such beings and would complete the perfection of the universe. Reason, therefore, can conclude the probable existence of angels, But we can know with certainty the fact that angels exist from faith, our master guide. The existence of the angels is clearly revealed by God in sacred scripture, where they are often mentioned, and where we find instances of their visitation to man. We must remember that when angels appear to man, they must necessarily assume a visible form. The visiting angels recorded in the scriptures came in human form, They either assumed real human bodies for the occasion or, more probably, the likeness or appearance of a human body. There are but three angels who are mentioned by name in the sacred scriptures. No doubt they all have names, for each angel has a most distinct personality. The three angels we know by name are Michael, Raphael, and Gabriel. They are of the order called archangels. Michael means who is like God. He is the patron or protecting angel, the guardian of the universal church. He is the archangel who led the angels in a great battle against Lucifer. And there was a battle in heaven. Michael and his angels battled with the dragon. Apocalypse 12.7 After his mighty victory, the archangel was placed at the head of the heavenly hosts. He still fights for mankind against Satan, and therefore our guardian angels are subject to him. St. Michael is especially powerful in rescuing souls from the snares of the devil, particularly at the hour of death. The Church celebrates the Feast of St. Michael on September 29th as a feast of the first class. In the prayers after low Mass, prescribed by Pope Leo XIII, we pray to St. Michael to defend us. Pope Pius XI directed that these prayers be said for the conversion of Russia. Strong in God is the meaning of the name Gabriel. He alone of all the angels was found worthy to announce to the Virgin Mary the designs of God in her regard. Luke chapter 1. We quote the words of the archangel Gabriel every time we say the Hail Mary. Hail, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. 
He is ever the angel of mercy and consolation, whereas Michael is rather the angel of judgment. Raphael's name means God heals. He is one of the seven spirits who always stand before the throne of God to offer him the incense of adoration. St. Raphael is the patron of travelers and also the patron of Catholic physicians. We will understand the reason for this patronage if we read the story of Tobias. The Church observes the Feast of St. Raphael on October 24th. The host of angels, from those who are closest to man to those who are closest to God, represent a magnificent ascending scale of beauty and perfection. This mysterious and wonderful hierarchy of orders is to a great extent a secret to us. Revelation, however, has given us a glimpse of its wonders. The New Testament mentioned nine choirs of angels, seraphim, cherubim, thrones, dominations, principalities, powers, virtues, archangels, and angels. In theological speculation, these choirs have sometimes been grouped into hierarchies. The first hierarchy. This group of three choirs, sometimes called counselors, is conceived of as being composed of the angels who stand about the throne of God and, according to a beautiful saying of St. Denis, abide in his vestibule. They seem to have little or no contact with human affairs. The seraphim are the most sublime creatures that God has drawn forth from nothingness. Their name signifies flame, love, and light. They are at the head of the hierarchies. Their faces are turned directly toward the divine trinity, and they approach, as close as the finite can approach, the infinite and eternal furnace of all love. The prophet Isaiah had a vision of them in the temple. He describes this vision in the first verses of chapter 6 of his prophecy. The cherubim, or the knowledge angels, come immediately after the angels of love, the seraphim. Their gaze is steadily fixed on the face of the eternal God. Their name signifies fullness of knowledge, for they contemplate the inmost reason of things in him, their source. Then they pass it on to the angels just beneath them. It was two of these cherubim who guarded the gate of Eden and carried out God's punishing decree in Genesis chapter 3. The thrones are service or foundation angels. They are so called because they bear up God's throne, or God, as it were, rests upon them as on a throne. They share, with the seraphim and cherubim, the privilege of seeing clearly the truth of all things in God. At the same time, it is the thrones who convey the orders of the great king to the lower hierarchies of angels. St. Paul mentions the thrones in his enumeration of the choirs. For in him were created all things in the heavens and on the earth, things visible and things invisible, whether thrones or dominations or principalities or powers. Colossians 1.16 The second hierarchy. This resplendent group is sometimes known as the rulers or governors. These angels represent God's power and are called dominations because they rule over all the angel groups which are charged with carrying out the commands of God. It is St. Paul again who mentions this choir along with others in his letter to the Ephesians. Above every principality and power and virtue and domination, in short, above every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. Ephesians 1.21 The name principalities signifies leaders. These angels represent the superior officers who appoint the various movements and exercises for those under them, in accordance with the general orders of the commanders-in-chief, the dominations. They are also ministering angels and protectors of rulers. Powers are invested with a special authority, as their name reveals. These angels of the second hierarchy are commissioned to remove obstacles which interfere with the execution of the divine commands. They are the protectors of mankind, banishing evil spirits who continually besiege nations in order to turn them from their appointed end. The third hierarchy is known as that of the messengers of God. Virtues. The name of these angels signifies strength or invincible courage. The virtues exercise power over the material world, presiding immediately over the laws which regulate it and maintaining the order and harmony we so much admire. Next are the archangels. Between the angels and us, there is a constant unseen communication and intercourse. 
The twofold office of the archangels is to fulfill important missions to men on certain solemn occasions, recall Gabriel and the message of the Incarnation, and to preside over the government of provinces, dioceses, and religious bodies. Their name singles them out as superior angels or as the princes among the angels. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 For the Lord himself, with cry of command, with voice of archangel, and with trumpet of God, will descend from heaven. We have already met the three great archangels. The term angel is applicable to all pure spirits created by God inasmuch as they are employed to manifest or carry out God's ideas, plans, or commands. But it is the distinctive name of the lowest choir from which the guardian angels are usually selected. These have the most direct and most constant relations with man. They watch over his spiritual and physical life from cradle to grave and obtain his hourly gifts of light and strength. From the House Tops Radio features the same Catholic doctrine, spirituality, church history, and apologetics published for over 40 years in From the House Tops magazine. This program, dedicated to the Immaculate Heart of Mary, promotes her cause in the age-old conflict with the powers of darkness. From the Housetops on WQPH 89.3 FM. Hi, this is Deacon Dennis Lambert, and you're listening to WQPH 89.3 FM from Shirley Fitchburg. Hello, this is Father Frank Pavone of Priests for Life. In these days, a special novena of prayer leading to Election Day is being held nationwide. This is part of the overall prayer campaign that Priests for Life has been holding throughout the year. You may sign up for the novena at electionprayer.com. This is an interdenominational and nonpartisan prayer, and it is available also in Spanish. The intentions of this novena are that believers will vote in the upcoming election, that candidates will recognize their duties toward God and human life, and that our nation will embrace a culture of life. Along with the power of prayer itself, the novena also gets people thinking about the election and about what they can do to inform and mobilize other voters. Let's all promote this novena of prayer. This is Father Frank Pavone, National Director of Priests for Life. This is Andy Cooney, and you're listening to 89.3 FM, WQPH, Shirley Fitchburg. I'm delighted that listeners in this area can enjoy Catholic radio from EWTN 24 hours a day. When you receive a request for a donation to help WQPH, please be as generous as you can. Thank you, Andy. Please help us at WQPH by sending your donation, large or small, to Eternal Life Radio, Post Office Box 589, Medford, Mass., 02155, or visit us online at www.wqph.org. Thank you for listening. On the WQPH 89.3 FM Community Calendar, there will be a special Mass praying for our country, on Saturday, October 24th, at noontime, this will be a daily Mass. It will not count as a Sunday Mass. It will not be a Vigil Mass. It will be the daily Mass. It will be held at St. Bernard's Parish, at St. Camillus Church, Mechanic Street in Fitchburg. At the end of this Mass, weather permitting, there will be a Eucharistic procession through the parking lot of St. Bernard's Parish at St. Camilla's Church, returning, when complete, back into the church. That is Saturday, October 24th at noon. This has been the WQPH 89.3 FM Community Calendar. You are listening to WQPH 89.3 FM Shirley Fitchburg, the home of Talk Catholic with Tim Kilcoyne. Ladies and gentlemen, I think we better have our opening prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Father, we have been warned, most especially by St. John Paul II, about the culture of death. Such is not a whimsical, trivial phrase anymore. This is reality before us. 
and it is time that we exercise our confirmation calling to be your soldiers and to take action against the evil one who is behind this very measure. The time has come for Christians to stand up and take action on behalf of our elderly who are as defenseless as those in the womb. I am reminded of the late senator from Minnesota, Hubert Humphrey, from my childhood, who once said, A civilization can be measured by how they treat people in the dawn of life and the autumn of life. We are indeed in our own autumn as a country if we continue to allow elite groups of legislators and other global socialists determine what is right and what is wrong. We turn to you, Lord, only for that measure of morality and the dignity of men and women. In Jesus' name, amen. Talk Catholic every Saturday afternoon at 1230 on WQPH. From the Housetops now continues Our Quest for Happiness. Facts about the angels. Their number. The angels are a countless host. The exact number, of course, we do not know. Nonetheless, the scriptures prove that they are so numerous we cannot think of them in terms of numbers. The prophet Daniel saw in a vision ten thousand times a hundred thousand angels in shining raiment standing before God, and thousands of thousands ministering to him. Daniel chapter 7. St. John, in his vision, heard the voice of many angels around the throne of God, and he saw thousands of thousands. Apocalypse chapter 5. The angels have wonderful attributes. The beauty of the angels is resplendent, dazzling. They are the most beautiful beings created by God, with the exception of the sacred humanity of our blessed Lord and our blessed Lady. But we who have seen only the beauty of material things cannot possibly conceive an idea of the radiant beauty of a pure spirit. This is a surprise in store for us. The angels also have powerful intellects. They have knowledge far beyond what we could grasp. This knowledge, at least in part, has been infused into them by God. If we wish to obtain the answer to an algebra problem, we must work it out. Our reason works step by step in the solution of problems which we meet in life, an angel, however, would know the answer at a glance, without reasoning. That is because the angel knows things by immediate insight. The seraphim, who stand closest to God's throne, with their burning faces turned toward him, receive knowledge directly from the source of all knowledge. This is then passed down from choir to choir of the descending orders. The Bible reveals the power of the angels when it tells us that one night, an angel slew 185,000 Assyrians in Sennacherib's army, 2 Kings 19. Moreover, an angel can move as swiftly as thought. Each one of us has one of these beautiful and powerful spirits as a guardian angel, one who is known to God by name and who always sees his face. It is an overwhelming thought if we really think about it. If it does not awe or thrill us, it is because we take the facts for granted as we do so many of God's gifts. If someone should ask how we know that each person has a guardian angel, we could say that we know it from our Lord's own words. Matthew 18.10 See that you do not despise one of these little ones, for I say to you, their angels in heaven always behold the face of my Father in heaven. The fathers of the church also teach that each person has an angel guardian. St. Jerome writes, how great is the dignity of the soul! Each one has from its birth an angel for its special protection. And St. Basil adds, No one can deny that every Christian has an angel at his side who teaches and directs him. The Church has established a feast in honor of the guardian angels to be observed on October 2nd and has dedicated the whole month of September in their honor, which is the Church's practical way of informing us that we have guardian angels. What our guardian angels do for us? From the reason for angelic visits to earth, which we have noted, we can list the services the angels perform for us. First, they are appointed as messengers from God to man. Secondly, the good angels influence our imagination, leading us to wholesome thoughts and prompting us to do good and avoid evil. In this way, they may help to counteract the influence exerted on us by the devil or by our own wayward inclinations. 
They are able to assist us in overcoming temptations if we cooperate. They are also able to assist us in work or study if we should call upon them. Thirdly, the good angels guard us from dangers threatening body or soul, especially from the attacks of the fallen angels. This last-mentioned service is the special work of the guardian angels. The principal object of their watchful care over us is the salvation of our souls. They are interested also in our earthly welfare, and therefore we should call upon them in times of danger, accident, trial, and misfortune. Lastly, the angels offer our prayers to God and intercede for us. It should comfort us to know we have an angel who always sees God and who talks to him about us, who tells him our needs and begs for assistance. The fallen angels, or demons, try to lead us astray. They are crafty, dangerous enemies. To defeat them, we need the help of the good angels, and we are never old enough to stop praying to our guardian angels for their aid and protection. Devotion to our guardian angels should increase with each day we spend in their presence and under their protection. First, we owe our watching angels love, for they are faithful guardians, true friends, and powerful protectors. We owe our angels respect or reverence, for though they are always with us, they enjoy the beatific vision at the same time. This thought of the presence of our guardian angels should remind us to be modest in our actions and should assist us to avoid sin. Our angels take such loving care of us that we certainly owe them devotion in return. We show this devotion by praying to our guardian angels and often thanking them for their care, as well as by resolving never to break our friendship with them by mortally offending their friend, the God they so happily serve. In conclusion, before we follow the angels and our first parents in their initial adventure of life, let us swiftly review the entire created universe. Visible creation may be represented by a huge triangle at whose base is found the kingdom of things closest to nothingness, those that merely exist but have no life. From this base there rise step by step amazing creatures, each excelling the other in perfection and likeness to their creator. Thus they rise, first non-living, then living material things, plants, animals, man. Man is at the top of the pyramid of visible creation. He possesses a material body, which makes him similar to the lower beings in the scale of creation, and he has a spiritual soul, which makes him similar to beings higher than himself, the angels and God. The invisible spirit world may also be represented by a triangle, an inverted triangle, its lowest point, human souls, touching the highest point of the triangle of visible creation, human bodies. And so we can think of the world of created spirits, with man on the lowest level, and with the angels towering above him. Above all, independent of all, more great and glorious than all else, together is the source and the goal of created things, our triune God. Man is the crown and the king of the visible universe. He is truly the masterpiece standing out above all these beautiful and varied creations. The true dignity of man and his place in the universe was stated centuries ago by the psalmist. Psalm 8, verses 6 through 7. You have made him little less than the angels and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him rule over the works of your hands, putting all things under his feet. Man, for whom all things in the world were made, was in turn made to know and love God, and to praise Him by joining His praises with those of the angels. This is a picture of the vast universe at its completion on the sixth day. And God saw all the things that He had made, and they were very good, and the evening and morning were the sixth day. So the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the furniture of them, and on the sixth day God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. Immaculate Heart of Mary School was started in 1976 in response to the needs of families who identified a crisis in Catholic education. To the present day, the brothers and sisters of the slaves of the Immaculate Heart of Mary continue their educational mission. I moved from Chicago two years ago before we moved, I was interviewing for jobs around the country, and each time I had an interview, I would look at the map of Latin masses around the nation 
and tried to find where there were centers for the Latin Mass near the city that I was interviewing in. I had an interview in Worcester, that was one of the interviews, and uh, I found St. Benedict Center with the uh, Immaculate Heart of Mary School attached, associated with that particular place. Uh, obviously, first of all, just being a private and religious school, the children learn theology, they learn the faith, they learn the things that they will not learn in the public school system. But of course, many Catholic schools can offer that. IHM, though, offers also classes that are taught by religious, that live the life that they teach about, and also partly, I guess, in fact, primarily because it's run by religious, the cost is quite low for the school that makes it accessible for larger families. And then, of course, there's just an entire community surrounding the school that includes the religious and the, the parents and all of the children. It's very welcoming to everyone. And ultimately, when it came down to it, I had several job offers, uh, and the deciding factor in my selecting the job offer from Worcester was the Immaculate Heart of Mary School. For more information, contact ImmaculateHeartSchool.org. The Manual for Total Consecration to Mary. This book contains the readings and prayers for St. Louis de Montfort's 33 days of preparation for consecrating oneself to Jesus through Mary. This manual includes complete texts from Holy Scripture, The Imitation of Christ, Montfort's writings and prayers used for total consecration, all in this one handy volume. The slaves of the Immaculate Heart of Mary of St. Benedict Center are pleased to make this manual available for those committing themselves to Mary for the first time or for those who wish to renew their consecration previously made. Available exclusively from St. Benedict Center. Go to stbenedict.com gift shop and order your copy of the Manual for the Total Consecration to Mary. From the House Stops is produced by the slaves of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, Still River, Massachusetts.